So I, I really appreciate your comments, Bjorn. I want to pick up on some of those, and I will try and be more positive, but it's very difficult on such a, a grey day. But I, th I do think there are solutions that we can learn from exactly what Bjorn talked about. We have a, a problem that is global, that affects us all. We all know people who've um, had infectious diseases, and if you go to uh, countries, developing countries around the world, you see the real impact they have. They have a huge economic cost, and I think that's very important. If we're to make the case here in the developed world that this is important, we should look at the economic damages from pandemics. And they have a very strong um, grounding in an interface between people, the environment, and wildlife. And that's really what I want to talk about. That's why I've got a picture of a bat up there, because it turns out bats carry a lot of these viruses. So how can we understand this complexity between humans, wildlife, and ecosystem change, and turn it to our advantage to do something about it? And I, I am an optimist. I, I firmly believe that we're, right now, because we're all in this room together, at the beginning of the end of what should be called the pandemic era, from uh, 1918 influenza, from HIV AIDS, in 50 years, 100 years' time, people hopefully will look back on this period and say, well, they've finally started to understand the problem and deal with it. Now, I run an organization called EcoHealth Alliance, and we try and bring together ecologists, veterinarians, mathematicians, economists, field biologists, and anthropologists, and social scientists to understand this, this system. And I want to make the point today that um, an ecological understanding can be very useful, and I want to try and take the best that ecologists have to offer, which is a very analytical science that tries to understand complex systems and apply that to this system that drives pandemics. So how do we do that? So we should start, I think, at the very basics. Where do these things come from? Can we understand the patterns of disease emergence so that we can then begin to go to the places where they emerge and try and stop them. So a few years ago, we started a project to do a basic e ecological approach, to just look at recent history and plot out where emerging diseases originated. And this is a map of about 350, 400 emerging infectious disease events. Some of them very small with just a few cases. One of them is HIV with 40 million cases. But each of them started somewhere on the planet. And each one, I believe, is equally important because if we can catch them at the very beginning of the um, outbreak and stop them there, then we can sometimes save one or two lives, but maybe perhaps save 40 million lives. So this is a plot from the literature of where people think different pathogens originated. One of them is HIV, one of them is West Nile virus. You can see um, where I'm from, the UK, is particularly bad for this, and where I live now in New York is equally bad for this. Um, Sweden is on there in a small way, no doubt some pathogens emerged here. Um, but of course this is biased, because where people are on the planet, that's where we look for pathogens. So the countries that can afford lots of research are going to identify more origins of emerging diseases. So what ecologists do is they analyze these trends and they've been doing it for decades in a systematic way, they correct the underlying bias in reporting and try and analyze them. So when you plot out over time all of those 450-odd events, this is what it looks like. So emerging diseases look like they're rising over time, but of course, science, you know, scientific research has increased over time, so we need to correct for that. When we do that and we analyze it, we do see a significant statistically significant rise over the last few decades of emerging diseases. So this is an issue that is growing, despite the increasing number of scientists working. And very interestingly, the yellow ones are diseases that originate in wildlife, HIV, Ebola, SARS, MERS, and as a proportion of the total, they're increasing very statistically significantly. And we can estimate about five new emerging diseases every year, and about three of those will originate in wildlife. So once we've done this analysis, we can then look at correlation between factors that we know from Bjorn's talk are, are supposed to be associated with emerging disease, and we can test out, are they statistically significant? 
And what we find, and this is a new analysis, by the way, it's not published yet, it's coming out in a couple of weeks, um, of exactly what those correlations are. And what we see is human population density is correlated with disease emergence. That's kind of obvious. Wildlife diversity is correlated. So this begins to get to the underlying issue. For emerging viruses especially, you're going to see more events in the tropics where there's higher biodiversity, where lots of people are expanding um, their impact. And for the first time on a global analysis, we see change in population and we see change in land use as a key driver. So this gets to the point beyond make, ecosystem change driven by it rapidly increasing human populations in countries with lots of wildlife are the key driver of pandemics. So I think this goes right to uh, 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 international development agenda. It tells us where we should focus our efforts. And it's not here in Sweden, it's not in the UK, despite my earlier map. It's in the tropics, in developing countries where people are at risk of new pandemics and where new pandemics will likely emerge and then spread through our travel networks. Okay, so that's where a, a new pandemic will emerge. What about what species will it come from? And we hear a lot about this. Obviously, primates are a key in our mind because they're closely related, but also because of HIV and uh, other diseases. We wanted to analyze this, and again, we used a, a typical ecological approach. We've got a database on every known virus, every known report of a virus-host relationship, and then analyze them in a very objective way. And what we find is, um, it's sort of counterintuitive. First of all, there are two real big issues. One is how closely related a wildlife species is to us. If it's very closely related, the viruses it carries should be able to infect us easier. So we should be at higher risk from chimpanzees than from platypus. So here's a, here's a list of, you can see from the pictures, the types of species. And this is the total viruses reported in the literature. Again, it's biased by what's out, what, what people have worked on. And what you see is ungulates have a very high number of viruses. That's because people work on them more than others because of domestic animals. When we analyze this and correct for that, we now see that bats come up as the, having the highest number of viruses per species, per people working on them, interestingly. So this isn't about contact, this is about a relationship, a type of species, and how it relates to us. When we look at whether that predicts for a zoonotic event or not, bats turn out to be the only group that significantly drives this pattern. So bats have a higher proportion of zoonotic viruses than any other group when you correct for all the underlying biases in the literature. So they really are a risky group. Primates, rodents, and bats are the three groups that turn out to be very significant. Now, ecologists are incredible. Once you've got this data set, you can start to tinker with it. When we know that the highest level of surveillance for a species, if we set that as the standard and make this sort of um, question, if we could do that level of surveillance for all known species, how many viruses would we find? And more importantly, where are the viruses missing from what we already know about? We start to be able to develop a map of where unknown viruses are probably out there on the planet. This gets to a solution. We can target these areas, we can go out and look for new viruses, and maybe find potential zoonoses before they have the chance to emerge, and start to develop countermeasures, start to look at behavioral risk in those countries, and change the relationship with these wildlife species. And that's exactly what we're doing now with funding through USAID, the US equivalent of CEDA. Um, and for the past few years, simply going to these hotspot areas in red, and you can see the big red dots are where we've been doing our sampling, working with local partners, b building capacity, understanding the risk there, and testing wildlife, bats, rodents, and primates for new viruses. And we've discovered about a thousand viruses. Some of them are already known, some of them are brand new. Um, from known viral groups with zoonoses. Now again, looking at it, that's interesting surveillance and we're starting to find some potentially risky viruses. But what about the ecological approach? What ecologists do with big data sets is incredible. And what we see, if you look at the discovery of viruses in this PREDICT program, 
um, in bats, we can start to see for coronaviruses, we see the discovery curve. Early on, when we start our sampling and testing, we rapidly discover new viruses. And then it gets harder to find new viruses, and the discovery curve saturates. Now, ecologists are used to this. Um, the, this is something they use to do analyses to predict how many unknown um, pathogens there would be in this group. So can we do that and actually get an, a handle on how big this dimension of potential pandemics is? So we set out to do that. And what we did is we sampled two species repeatedly in a very standardized way. We did a standardized um, viral discovery in the lab, and we looked at the discovery of new pathogens. And we used the algorithm that ecologists use to predict the unknown number based on the number of new ones and the number of repeat identifications. And it becomes quite interesting. Very early on, after about 500 individuals sampled, we start to see the discovery curve saturate. Once you've got up to 1,500 or so, you get a really good estimate of the unknown number of viruses in a species. Now, we, we can't do this for every species on the planet. That's a huge amount of work. But we can extrapolate from this for the number of known viral families that cause zoonoses and the number of known mammals on the planet, which we have a very good handle on. And what we find is we get an estimate for the first time ever of the total unknown viral diversity on the planet. It's about 1.6 million unknown viruses. And there are big error bars around that. It sounds like a lot, but I was actually quite pleased about this. This is a, this is a manageable number. Because we've been doing this program for a few years, we, we know how much it costs to go and discover those viruses. So we know if we wanted to expand that globally, how much it would cost. And what we estimate, for about 68% of, of, um, of unknown viruses, would cost about $1.2 billion. It's a lot of money. But actually, if you think about that as a decade-long project, $120 million a year, that's an affordable amount of money. It's about roughly equivalent to USAID's Emerging Pandemic Threats program annually over a 10-year period. And this is exactly what we're trying to do to start this project. We're calling it the Global Virome Project. And a group of us are trying to get this agenda and see if it's actually fundable, see if we can get countries to get behind it, get agencies to get behind it, the private sector to get behind it, and finally start to discover the total diversity of risky viruses on the planet. A lot of them won't come to anything, but some of them, hopefully, will be the next HIV and we'll stop them before they happen. And we've got a, a very good idea of where we would do that work based on where diversity is on the planet. And we can actually begin to say we can get a cost estimate per country, per field site of where we should do this to get the most rapid discovery and the biggest bang for the buck. So we have phase one, two, and three. We have a couple of countries already who want to do this work. And this project is going to be launched at the Prince Mahidol Award Congress meeting in Thailand on January the 30th. So if you're going to be there, please come along to that session. Um, what would the advantages of discovering viruses like this be? Because you know, this isn't anything more than finding sequences of new viruses. Well, I do think there's intrinsic value in just doing that. And here's a couple of examples. In bats, which we identified a few years ago as the origin of SARS coronavirus, once you start looking at other bats in China, you start to find a very big diversity of SARS-like coronaviruses. The human SARS is at the top in red, and then the blue ones are all these new bat viruses that are close to SARS. What we find is some of them can invade human cells in, in the lab. And when we go to rural populations in Yunnan province and test them for serology against SARS, we start to see evidence that people in China are still now being exposed to these bat viruses that could become the next SARS. So there is a, a significant risk, and just finding these new viruses gives us a handle on what could emerge. In fact, one of these viruses is very close to SARS, but is not affected by the monoclonals that can be used therapeutically on SARS in a mouse model. So it tells us when we're developing therapeutics and vaccines, knowing the greater diversity of what's out there allows us to develop better therapeutics or better vaccines for future pathogens. So we don't just keep going to the ones we know. We're now beginning to arm ourselves against the ones we don't yet know that could emerge in the future. A solution.
Another use to doing all this work is that we get a handle of what's out there in wildlife. And recently in southern China, there was a very large outbreak in pigs of a new virus that seemed close to one from bats. We looked at our collection of samples and found, sure enough, we had in blue um, a series of samples from bats that live near these pig farms in southern China. And we found this new virus in bats and in pigs. It's called Swine Acute Diarrheal Syndrome Coronavirus. It killed over 25,000 pigs in southern China over a period of a few months, and it originates in bats. So we can use this just by knowing those sequences. We know which bats they come from. We can now look at how do the bats have connection to the pigs, and can we block that connection? So there's use in just finding these viruses. But of course, $1.2 billion is a huge amount of money to begin the end of the pandemic era. Will we get a good return on our investment? So we, we did a quick analysis, economic analysis, of the cost of pandemics. And even the small outbreaks um, drive the bulk of this event. Um, SARS at $30 to $50 billion drives a lot of this. So over the next 50 years, $3.5 trillion of, of uh, cost. If we look at a 10-year program, our return on investment would be 100 to 1. So I think that is a significant and useful argument. If we couple that with dealing with the underlying drivers, like land use change, and we can show that if you include the cost of the health events related to emerging disease from land use change, that we are over-exploiting the planet. And if we also focus on clear win-win, such as focusing on the wildlife trade, which is a huge conservation issue, as well as an ethical dilemma and a driver of pandemics, I think we could have a real significant way to impact these pandemics and begin the end of the pandemic here. So I want to thank the funders of this, and thanks to you, the organizers. Cheers. Thank you. We have time for one short question. Anyone in the audience? Yes, please. Can I have a microphone here? Where are the microphones? Can you come here? Oh, you're good. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Peter, for excellent presentation. Ulf Magnusson, SLU Global here. Um, mm. This might be heuristic, but you, you showed when you were about to identify the possible hotspots or the future hotspot for a emergency, you had human population, and then you had the number of mammalian species, I think. Mm. Uh, that sort of opposed the idea of that by diversity buffering this. And, and I think I read some papers in, in Nature and Science some 10, five years ago, and I haven't followed the literature there uh, any longer, but there were exper experimental field studies in voles or, or rodents. And I think it's the, the concept of that by diversity's buffering was inconclusive in these yeah. papers. C could you elaborate on that a little no, bit? Because it's, it's a controversy, I think. It's a very good point, and you know, Bjorn mentioned that, it, that biodiversity somehow protects us. In our analysis for emerging diseases, biodiversity is a risk factor, unfortunately. And I'm a conservationist, so what, what the message needs to be is if wildlife carry potential future pathogens, we shouldn't be eating them, we shouldn't be chopping down the forest, we should protect the areas where biodiversity exists and avoid emerging diseases. So that's the message we're trying to put across. And certainly things like the wildlife trade for food are a clear, obvious risk for new pandemics to emerge, as well as a huge conservation impact. So I think that we can use this unfortunate connection to um, advanced conservation as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Thank Peter. Very much. Cheers. Thank you.